What is up, mathletes? This is the Sand Project, and that is the Sand Man right here. Okay, so let's take a look. Uh, frequently asked questions. First of all, this is a partner project, so that means you're going to be getting, when you get into class, uh, you'll be in the groups of one or two to work on this. Um, when is it due? It's going to be due after two in-class work periods. Uh, then what do you have to turn in at the end of, um, on, on the next day, you'll have to turn in a video recording. Uh, only one person has to do that. You have to turn that into Google Classroom. What's it worth? 100 points, which is the same as a quiz. And what do you want? What should you do if you want a good grade? Well, you should preview your work with me. As always in all of these projects, I want you. I want this to be a collaborative process. I want you to do your best, and then um, when we have our one on ones, um, I want you to. Uh, I'll give you lots of advice on how to do better or how to what changes to make or improvements that you can do or things to think about and um and i want this to be collaborative very much like research and you know or uh when, when you get out in the real world you're not going to be isolated but you have uh, you know, experts in the field that you can um talk with and collaborate with so that's 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 the spirit that i want this to be in um of course i'm i'm the one assigning this but i also uh, I'm the one challenging you with this assignment, but I'm also the one who wants you to do well. As, so uh, I'm going to give you lots of feedback and, and help you through the whole process. Um, also, you should check the rubric. It's going to be the same as before, and uh, make sure you have every element in that long rubric um, present in or addressed in your presentation. Why are we doing all this? Uh, we want to solidify Chapter 4 concepts. I want you to do a full graphical analysis um, on higher level polynomials now. Um, but also, a big picture, I want you to get good at tackling tasks and reporting your findings. You know, that's something that you're going to have to do more and more in higher level education and um, STEM fields and nonprofits and startups and established companies. So, there's uh, plenty of times in your life where your boss is going to be like, hey, I have this this task, I have this cloudy, thorny question that um, I'm not even sure what the question is, but I need you, the student, to figure it out, um, or you, you, the employee, to figure it out. Uh, and I want you to report back to me what you have. Um, I think that's a really important skill, and I want to practice it here and now. Um, I want you to tell, the, uh, and when you report your findings, I want you to tell the full research story in the format of a STEM presentation. I think those are skills we can practice now, and I want you to leave my class having them refined and practiced. During this time, there's going to be uh, there's no test, no end of chapter four test. There's no Alex assignments. There's no um, uh, Desmos collaborative uh, slides to be working on. And then, but I will ask you to turn in uh, Edpuzzle five point one on the day that this project is also due, so that we can uh, we can start chapter five on the same day. Next, production workflow. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a video. The, the, the thorny question that I have and the data that you have to extract is all contained in a single YouTube video. And I'll give you a link. The very last slide of this uh, presentation, uh, this Google slide, has links uh, to the YouTube video. And then you'll take that YouTube video and you'll pull the data out of it and put it onto Desmos. And then from Desmos, you'll um, you'll create uh, your findings and your analysis, and you can screenshot those things and put them on Google Slides. And then that Google Slide, when you're finished, you'll do a recording and then put that recording on Google Classroom, as you can see right there. That's the production workflow. I want, you to, I want to tell you about how I made this YouTube video. Um, and also, I wanted, and in this YouTube video, you also have the central question: At what time in the video does the sand run out and reach its final height? And the Sandman, you know, if you know anything about the Sandman, sometimes the sand the sand runs out, and uh, that's pretty significant. But here, I want to know when does the sand run out in the actual video? So let's talk about that video. So here, here's a screenshot of iMovie, and that's um, you can see there's the clip and. Uh, the the sand doesn't actually start pouring until like maybe a, I don't know ten or fifteen seconds into the actual video, and at that point the sand starts pouring, and then towards the very end the sand runs out. And actually, the answer to the entire whole project is contained right there. Um, 
and the second arrow, when the sand runs out, I want to know at what time in the video does the sand run out, and it's right there. And if um, if I just gave you it in this format, then you'd have the actual answer, and you wouldn't have to do any math. But what I do next, um, and if in the editing process is I actually split the clip and I discard um, the answer. So you don't have, you don't, you, you'll never actually see the sand running out. The, the video will end and you'll, um, it'll still be pouring. And then I want you to know that the event continued past the video that I give you because I've split it and discarded the actual answer part. Um, so you might say, Mr. Bergman, how do you? How am I going to figure out when the sand runs out? Well, I will say that um, I also I took a photo, a screenshot of what it looks like when the sand runs out, and you can and I put that back in the in uh, as one of the overlaid photos. I've got like I don't know eight, seven or eight different overlaid photos that I actually put into the video, and I do that for two reasons. Number one, I do want you to have a screenshot of what it looks like when the sand runs out, so you have access to that. And number two, I also wanted to um, I wanted to give you kind of messy uh, data I, w I wanted you to have breaks in the data so you should be able to like look at the time and the height of the sand pile as the as the sand accumulates um, but when there's a f overlaid photo you actually won't be able to get any data because you'll <laughs> you might wish that you were you could see the, the sand pile but there's a there's another photo blocking your view um, it's been overlaid on top or superimposed on top and um and i just want i intentionally did that because i wanted to um give you breaks uh portions where there's like no data available and i want and uh, to convince you or to show you the power of the software that we're using that doesn't need a smooth continuous um stream of data you can have bits over here and bits over you know bits missing and um and that's okay and even um the, the idea that it starts pouring kind of like part of at time equals zero there's there's no event yet maybe at time equals 10 or 15 seconds that's when the event starts so you can actually start with a, a time of 15 seconds and a height of zero and the software that we're using has, and the techniques that we're using is going to be able to accommodate for all that so that's what that looks like and then i've um i took this n not the part where the sand runs out where the x is but the rest of it and i turned it into a video and i uploaded it to youtube and i'm, I'm gonna and I actually made several versions of it so that everyone would get kind of different answers um so but that's what you'll have access to research workflow so i wanted to talk about what it's going to look like so i'm going to give you this video and it's the top. And then from that video, we need to start thinking about the variables that are involved in here. And um, I wish there were a way, a way around this. It's kind of strange. Uh, usually, I want time to be the independent variable. I want to be to kind of like x is. And then um, the other thing that depends on time would be the, you know, in the, in the second column, the y values. But here, um, it's it's going to be strange, and the reason for this is because of the math. Just the math gets a lot easier if we do it uh, this one time. If we flip things around a little bit and let time depend on volume, which is depending on height. So on the graph, what that means is the y-axis is going to be time, and the x-axis is going to be height. And it's really bizarre. It's the only time the whole year this will happen. Um, bear with me, and you'll maybe you'll understand the reason why uh, when we get to chapter eight is six and or maybe even chapter nine um you can ask me then why and i'll tell you uh, because we have the math to understand but just to simplify the math right now h is going to be uh an x value and t is going to be y value so and then um once you once we kind of think about that then you should be able to make a table of values and so um here you, you're on desmos i want you to actually put h1 t1 and then find go back into the video and find 15 instances where you can have both a height and a time uh, established. So like, I don't know, at time equals zero, the height is 15 uh, centimeters. No, sorry, I got that backwards. At time equals 15 seconds, that's when the whole thing starts at say zero centimeters or whatever it is. Um, or maybe like 10 seconds in 10, when time is 10, then height is gonna be, I don't know, three centimeters. So um, 
make 15 instances of these. And then next, you're going to have to graph your regressions. So just like in the strobe light parabola project, um, you have to type in some sort of regression. And this time, I'm not going to tell you what it is, um, which one it is. I'm going to say that it could be either quadratic or cubic or quartic. And I want you to kind of figure it out. And I want you to, to think about um, which regression is most appropriate here. Um, in the strobe light parabola project, I told you, I went out and said, okay, Sir Isaac Newton kind of firmly established it. It's quadratic. And so we're going to use a quadratic regression. And this is what it looks like. Uh, it, it, was, it was very much like this top one here where the, the highest exponent was two. But maybe here we're in a situation where the highest exponent should be three or maybe even four. And I want you to figure it out. And there's um, three different ways that uh, we should be able to choose so, so what I want you to do, sorry, backing up, I wanted, I, you should type in all three of these statements into your Desmos. You've got um, on your Desmos table, you've got 15 rows, and then you should, you can also type in these three statements. And, um, and then you should be, it'll give you three different curves. And um, just a side note, uh, here, it goes A, B, C, D, A, B, C, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, and then I skipped E and go straight to F. And that, the reason for that is just because E is a very special thing, and the letter E is a very special thing in mathematics and algebra. And so I don't want to, like, you never, you've actually never solved an equation where it's like E plus 4 equals 5. That's in algebra, we, we just don't use E because E has other special meanings. So just skip E and go to F, and I'll tell, me, tell you more about that in class if you want. Anyway, type these three in, and it should give you three different curves and three different value, three different values of A, B, C, or the, the constants that you see there. And it's going to be your job to try to try and choose the regression to model your data. And so, it, the answer um, there is a firmly established answer, uh, and I want you to figure out what it is. Just like in the strobe light parabola project, the firmly established answer was, yeah, this this golf ball is flying through the air with um, and it's quadratic in nature so we use a quadratic to model it and here I want you to, to do the same thing I want you to figure out which one it is is it quadratic cubic or quartic and there's a there's a right and one right answer and two wrong ones um, and there are three different ways that I want you to uh, three different kind of conversations that will help you uh, narrow down on which one it is so you have to choose the regression to model your data your data like I said, it's either quadratic or cubic or quartic. And I want you to think about three different things. First of all, um, maybe the easiest one to talk about is the R squared values. When you do Desmos and you type in the tables and you type in these three different statements, you actually get R squared values. And if any of those R squared values are uh, greater than 0.99, like one, like an R squared value of equal to one is perfectly, the, the curve goes through all the data perfectly. Um, and in the real world, that just doesn't happen. Uh, the data is messy, and that's fine. So, but is it good enough? Like the the cutoff here is 0.99, and if it's 0.99 or higher, then you can give it a green light and say, okay, this could be possibly the actual uh, parent function uh, that we want to use, the regression that we want to use. So, um, if it's uh, equal to 0.99 or less, then it gets a red flag and you don't have to use it you, or you can discard it and say this is not what I'm going with. But if it's uh, greater than 0.99, then it gets a green light and, and it could be one of the potential, like it's still potentially one of the ones we could use. Then there's also formulas. And I don't know if you remember, but maybe four lessons ago, we talked about um, these notes and it might be worthwhile to pull up uh, when it comes down to that. And you remember, um, if I said that if you're dealing with a circle and, and a circumference, then that would be linear in nature. The circumference is a, a one-dimensional uh, phenomenon. And so therefore, when you're dealing with a whole bunch of circumferences, then that should be, you should use a linear regression. And then, uh, for example, here, oh, if, the, if you're dealing with a sphere and it is cubic in nature, then you should use a cubic regression. Uh, for the volume, the volume of the sphere is cubic. The surface area of the sphere would be uh, two-dimensional because you could say the surface area is like three centimeters squared. It's a two-dimensional phenomenon, and if you were modeling surface area, then you would you would need a, a quadratic regression because it's quadratic or a degree of two in nature. So that's what you would use. Anyway, 
uh, I want you to think about now that you know what the event is, I want you to think about that event and you know what kind of shape is this is this sand pile? And is there a formula that you can find? And are we looking at the volume or the circumference or the surface area of that shape that is increasing with time? And so if that is going to be either quadratic or cubic or quartic. So looking at this, are we looking at the surface area or the volume or the, or the circumference? And then what degree is that? And if you know what degree the, the phenomenon that you're looking at, then you can choose the right regression. And lastly, the shape of the graph. You should be able to type in all three of these statements and look at the shape of the graph and know, um, and just know uh, that as the volume increases, so and the height increases, so does the time. And if if uh, if you get something, if you get some sort of a curve out of one of these statements that doesn't indicate that it doesn't like line up with that then you can describe that also um so uh one one last thing before i, I turn you loose on the on the task is that i want you to uh i want you to know that there's actually no re related questions beyond those that are already signed in uh telling the research story so if you're telling the research story and you're following the rubric you don't need to worry about any other related questions that are not already assigned in there so here's what I want you to do. I want you to find this Google slide on Google Classroom. I want you to find a link. So and then once so once you pull this up, you'll go to the very last slide, which is here, and I want you to choose any of these links. They all come they'll go to different data and each of these has its own answer. And I want you to pick one and uh, watch the video. Then I want you to go to desmos.com slash calculator, or you can click on this link and um, click the plus and add a table, like you know how to do, just like in the Strobe by Parabola project. Then um, on the top of the table, you can do H1 and T1, that's height and time. And I want you to add 15 rows of data. Watching the video, pull out 15 different instances where you can firmly establish what the height is and what the time is in seconds. Um, I want you to use T1, if you're when you're typing in T1, uh, just directly use the YouTube timestamp. No need to adjust for the fact that uh, the sand starts pouring uh, 10 or 15 seconds into the video, that's fine. Um, no need to adjust for the idea that the photos were superimposed. You can just actually use the, the YouTube timestamp directly. When you do it, record it in seconds. So like if you get to uh, 70 seconds in, type in 70, don't type in 1.10. That's like one, like one minute and 10 seconds. No, uh, it'd be a lot easier because honestly, uh, the uh, things are way more confusing. It's more, much more direct to use seconds. Uh, so 70 seconds in, two minutes would be 120 seconds in. And that is that. Wow, I've given you a lot to do, and uh, I've said a lot, and I've given you uh, a task. I want you to spend some time doing that, and if you can, bring, bring your Desmos table to class tomorrow, and I'll pair you up uh, in, into your groups. And I hope you'll have something significant to show your partner. Thanks uh, for watching and paying attention and thinking critically. Uh, bring your questions to class tomorrow and we'll answer them. Take care and I can't wait to see what you come up with.